Raymond. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Corey. Thanks for having me. Great content on here. I learned a lot from it and uh, very happy to be a part of it. Right on, man. So excited to have you talk about what I think is kind of a growing trend is, you know, everybody thinks about apartment syndication and, and doing big deals. However, there's a really nice niche in these smaller multis that I really uh, I'm excited to have you talk about it because I think uh, I've seen this done in my mastermind a lot, especially for the newer entry level deals. But what you guys are doing is is, is even scaling it to a, a whole nother level. So I would love for you to talk about that. But before we do that, can you kind of just give a little bit of background about yourself and, and, and your company? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Ray Hyman here. I uh, am a, a Clevelander originally, so so big Browns fan. Wasn't our year this year, but uh, next year we're coming. Uh, but very much so a Midwesterner. My dad had a pretty massive influence on my life. He's an architect, so I grew up around construction designs. Back then they had those little wooden models of, of architectural designs. And so those are always around the house and I would step on them and get yelled at. But he would take us to Frank Lloyd Wright houses, falling water, so on. And that was always my summer job, you know, working on his job sites. And so I really got an appreciation for real estate and architecture through that. I'm not an artist or an architect by any means. I'm an investor for sure, but uh, at a fundamental level, I really love what I invest in. And I owe that that passion largely to uh, to him. But um, what I do today, you know, comes a lot from that background. So shipped off from Cleveland to New York for school. I went to Columbia. That's where I met my absolutely stellar business partner, Tom Higgins. He is a, a total stud, so to speak, in the uh, construction and development space there. Um, and, uh, you know, the two of us uh, really got started working together in college. We were in New York, so we did a lot of, uh, you know, smaller multifamily properties there. Um, there's a tremendous number of walk-ups in the city. Um, there, a lot of them are, are unappreciated. They're owned by mom and pops, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we, we got in that way. We were doing a little bit more old school kind of word of mouth to find deals, but we found a good number of them. And, you know, while we were in school, we, we closed them and started, you know, renovating them, et cetera. You know, we had pretty serious jobs after school. Tom worked for a national development firm. Um, I worked for JP Morgan in, in investment banking. I was at Booz & Co and acquisition strategy. I worked for a PE fund, Severica Capital, but, um, as so often is the case, you know, that kind of side hustle that we were doing along the way became the full-time gig. And we kind of combined that, you know, side hustle becomes the main hustle, right? Always does. Right. It's uh, <laughs> you, you wake up one day and you're looking and Hey, kind of making more money from this than I am from this nine to five. And uh, it's a lot more fun. Right. So, yeah. so that's, that's how we got started. And um, We'll love to to get into to Tara and what we're doing today, but it all kind of started with those roots there. Oh, that's awesome. That's an amazing journey. Like, so it's there's so, so many different ways to kind of get started in this business. And any way you can get there, it's, it's always well, I always neat to hear everybody's like, story of when they got the download from the mothership, right? And it's neat to see that your dad gave you some of the good hindsights of, hey, this is what it looks like. But then you you went out and probably discovered your own way and it's probably a little different way, right? Exactly. And uh, we we had got started with all these these small properties, but we looked at each other one day, Tom and I, and we kind of said, hey, we're getting pretty good at this, but New York is tough. Um, at our day jobs, You know, we're looking at all these other markets outside of New York. We're super well-equipped to analyze them. What say we come up with our own framework of where to invest and how to do that in a in a scalable way? But let's stick with these smaller multifamily properties that we're buying from pretty unsophisticated sellers that maybe own one or two, and then we're turning around and selling a completed product to a very sophisticated buyer that's paying significantly more per unit. And so that's you know it's exactly what we did, and uh, you know we expanded into Pittsburgh. We've and that's that's really Columbus. the Terra Capital. That's exactly that's your business model, right? Is like, is, is that right? So let's let's jump into that and get more detail what that looks like. Let's yeah, start. sure. So you know we're we're multifamily real estate investors, but uh, you know we do it a little differently. We're focused on the lower middle market. So we're, we've actually been trying to get the the term mini multi coined for a while now. But specifically, you know, that means we're looking at two to 15 unit buildings. It's really the smallest apartment buildings out there. 
And it sounds like a lot of headache, you say, and it is, which provides us good barriers to entry. But the, the key to what we're working on is that this is the part of the market that is too big for flippers and too small for developers. So if you think about that for a second, we have a huge competitive advantage where other groups just aren't capitalized and sophisticated enough to do many of these deals on a frequent basis and at scale. And then the groups that are would potentially be able to do this is just so far below their threshold that it's not even on their radar. So they would not um, even touch it. I would probably not ever touch it, right? I'd be just like, yeah, I'm not not gonna do that, right? My that sounds like work. It is it is work, Corey. And the uh the it's uh it's a lot of brain damage. It's brain damage for returns, right? But our whole model is all right, this is a difficult, complex thing to do. How do we put the systems in place and get the vendors in place and the technology there so we can do it repeatably, scalably? with reduced, but certainly non-zero brain damage. Right. But and, now it's you a know, system and a process that runs, right? So that's the machine. Exactly. Machines tend to work pretty good when you set them up correctly. They do. And uh, we always think about it as tinkering with and, and adding components onto our engine. And that's where we focus every day is making that machine stronger and stronger. So what we do now is, you know, anywhere from 15 to 25 units a month, um, we take down, uh, we renovate those over the course of, you know, four to six months. And, you know, the, the biggest log jam in our system now is, you know, how do we add more markets to that space? You know, I'd love to talk about where we, where we choose to invest, but we're super now, picky. Do you, are you going to keep, are it. you going to hold them for a little bit or do you just fill them up and get them? And then you find your, uh, uh, cause then you're selling it to wall street, right? Exactly right. So what we're what we're doing is uh, really aggregating these smaller apartment buildings yeah. into portfolios. So we're this is a great arbitrage process. Huge. So what the way we always try to make it real for folks is that we buy at around a hundred dollars a square foot. And once we're all done with renovations, we're in that kind of one sixty to one seventy dollars a square foot range. Yeah, and our portfolios trade in that kind of two fifty to two seventy five dollars a square foot range. Obviously, we have a hold period of five years, so that appreciates over time. But that's really the arbitrage there between what we're buying, which are very underappreciated rundown assets, but in great locations, and what we're selling, which is a fully turnkey institutional grade asset that is Wall Street grade. There's also family offices that go after these things, you know, private equity funds that are going for them. And that's that's different. I think a lot of other folks are would do this and then flip it in 18 months when they're done. That's huge. So there's what because you you have an unlimited buyer source of people that want to buy that product. And and they really there is a big need for that. And Wall Street's trying to put money to work they're more now in real estate than ever, in my opinion. And um, oh yeah. So if you can find a way to leverage and play with it, and it, now did you find that relationship from uh, your days being uh, in New York? Or that's exactly right. And you know, we when we are going to exit, we like to work with you know larger brokerages that'll get us kind of that top dollar per unit. But ultimately, the the rumblings have been around that there's going to be more involvement for a while. Some of it was quiet, TPG's involvement with mobile home parks, right? But then KKR and every other major Wall Street group getting involved in single family roll-ups, right? As well as more of that kind of middle market multifamily real estate. And we're in this kind of nice niche in between where the entry point into our space is very difficult. It's a lot of work. It's a lot more complicated asset than a single family home to purchase. But on the back end, it's a potentially more valuable asset for Wall Street because there's less volatility in home prices. Multifamily is steady as she goes. It's right. not jumping it's up not 20 going and down up 20. like this. Yes, yes. Exactly. Especially the farther you get to the coast, both sides, that even gets accentuated even more. And they just want bread and butter returns, right? That's right. And and on top of that, they are so hungry. There's so many groups that are so hungry for that 100 to 150 unit plus deal. But there's only so they many of those priced assets. out of the market. Yeah, there's everybody's competing for the same thing. Yes. And especially with interest rates rising, they can't go after those lower cap rate deals. 
So the the higher higher yield portfolios have become something that they are are very hungry for, but there's not that many coming to market. Right. You so know, Ray, you're providing so. something that's totally totally needed in that marketplace. And really, I always say this. I've said this a lot. Right. What is Wall Street like? They like nice, steady, rising income. The more steady, the better. The, the and they'll overpay for that kind of product because they want an easy button. They want to see a big fat easy button. When your financials look solid, you got a nice tracker. There's not any crazy dips in the income, you know, on a, on a T12. It looks steady. Steady as she goes is money. That's exactly right. And on top of that, because it's a multi-location investment, the risk is hedged across different neighborhoods in the same market. You get exposure to positive things that happen in a neighborhood that you might not have been thinking of. Whereas you have a single asset and something bad happens down the street or a casino comes in down the street. Maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, but whatever it is, you're overly exposed to that single geographic point. Whereas the spread portfolio just offers you know, one more risk hedge that they are very attracted to. Yeah. So what markets do you like? To, are you playing in right now? Yeah. So when it comes to markets, we are really hyper-focused, kind of nerdy, very data-first folks. But what we're looking for are strong affordability metrics. We want to be well below the 25% line where what percent of your total rent is of your median income in that area. Uh, We want really good growth and not just nominal top line growth. We want growth in really sticky, high paying, recession resistant industries. We're looking at healthcare growth. We're looking at education growth. We're really focused on medium and low cost location tech and business services jobs growth so that in a recession, those jobs aren't going away. And if anything, the trend towards cost cutting improves that. And then on top of that, we want low regulatory risk, right? We were in New York for long enough. We're done with, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're done with it. We're done with that part of it. So the markets that we've Catch identified- teeth on the worst and the hardest uh, ever, right? Exactly. And uh, lessons learned. It was in our it was in our backyard. Thankfully, we we did well with it, but it's uh, it's too hard to operate. So where we are today are, are Pittsburgh, Columbus, Cincinnati and Indianapolis. And those markets are all very similar. They have fantastic universities, great large hospital systems, and they've all been their own sort of special hub for this kind of medium and low cost location business services job. Part of it is in the Midwest as a rising tide raises all ships kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but these are really the standout kind of jewels in that story. You know, Not every MSA in the Midwest is right for us. Um, and so we spend a lot of time doing the analysis to make sure that we've kind of got the best markets because we set up shop for the long term. We don't want to invest in something and, and be out in five years once it loses steam. Yeah, we actually invested in um, it's called Slippery Rock, a student housing project it's about 40 minutes north of Pittsburgh. But yeah, we looked at it as the reason we liked the deal was because of Pittsburgh. Right. And it's like, OK, it's a nice it's like where you send your kids to college. that's affordable. That's still close to home, but far enough away. Right. Yeah. They had a huge nursing program. It's like it's never going to go away. It's going to be there forever. And um, and so like and we liked consistency. Oh, yeah. That's a beautiful investment. And and Slippery Rock is a great example of the sort of byproduct of Pittsburgh education, right? You've got Pitt, you've got Carnegie Mellon, and there's just so much demand for education. And it's seen as such an education hub in that part of the US. Yeah. That even the, the affordable universities on top of that just get a lot of steam. Like you said, great nursing program. And it seems like every other week there's some story about a, a you know another two hundred million dollar UPMC development going up somewhere in Pittsburgh, right? So yeah. it snowballs. Yeah, nice, nice. So then, what does the future look like for you guys? So, like, does this strategy? How long does in our current economic environment? How long does that strategy last? Do you do you think you ever change it, or is it just say hey, right now this is what's working and it's working well? Yeah. So, you know, what we like to say is that our uh, our model works in all climates. And we, we've proven that because we've been in New York during bad times and good times. And New York is probably the worst place to invest in, in real estate in a lot of ways. 
And so we did very well there. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere kind of a thing. But more specifically, it, the model works extremely well in a recessionary environment. It's got a lot of acyclical aspects to it. It's very recession resistant. It's obviously a great hedge against inflation, but because it's high yield, it's also a great protection against rising interest rates. Right. So over the next five years, who knows where interest rates are going to be? Probably not way higher and probably not way lower than where they are right now. But where they sit, we still have a three or 400 bit spread versus you know where we can finance our assets, which is just not true for, for a lot of multifamily right now. And in addition, fear enhances our returns, right? I mean, we're buying from unsophisticated sellers. Frequently, they're impacted by downturns. It brings them to market. It's a win-win situation because there's it's there's not that many groups that can buy their right. type of asset. And so it's something that works really well now, but we think it works in all, all in the, times. In those markets, are you doing direct mail? Like, is that your, uh, what, what's your marketing uh, uh, go-to that works the best? Yeah. So we are uh, 70% off market. So, um, you know, we still buy from brokers. We compete in those processes, et cetera. But um, we are 70% off market and it's real off market. It's not, you know, pocket listings and things like that. Yeah. It is really any medium that you can imagine a seller might be, you know, receptive over. We get in touch with them that way. So it's, there's cold call, there is uh, direct mail, there's email. And the, the top of our funnel, which is really the part that I kind of brought my acquisition strategy stuff into uh, to build is super tech enabled and is constantly changing and morphing and being experimented on so that we can get that 70% off market to yeah. 85, 90% off market. Yeah, this um, is the optimization of your whole sales process, right? It really is. This is what, uh, you know, for anybody that's listening, this is what you learn in the single family space, really, honestly. Uh, my, my friends that are wholesalers, they live and breathe on this type of stuff. Like it's data, getting the phone to ring, uh, PPC, pay-per-click, pay uh, you know, direct mail, getting the phones to ring and then having a follow-up process that's relentless is what brings these deals in. And this is actually a great example of the, of the similarity and the difference between us and SFR rollups, right? Because it's a very similar conversation and a lot of the infrastructure is there to dial and mail, et cetera. But uh, the asset class is very different. And here's a really good example of that. A lot of single fams are owned by individuals. They're very easy to look up. Their user information is right there. You can Google a property and find out who owns it. But in a lot of our markets, more than 80% multifams are owned by LLCs. Yep. Um, so all, already you've got this massive wrench thrown in the system of how you know an SFR aggregator would contact their sellers. So we've got a lot of tech solutions, vendors, data analytics in place to get around those issues. Yep. Um, but it's a different, more complex asset class. But a lot of the, you're right, a lot of the root kind of strategies are very similar. It's the same process. You got to, you probably have to, you have to change a couple of different processes around to get, to get the, the raw data that you need. But once exactly. you have it, then is the process is pretty straightforward that we've done in the SFR uh, uh, piece of it. But my point is, is it's, it works, right? So that one to 15, one to 20 is a direct to the seller type of conversation and it works really, really well. And it's money, right? It's like, it's it's money, and it's a win-win, right? A lot of these uh, a lot of these sellers are haven't thought about this property in ages. They might have inherited it. They probably missed a couple tax payments because they just forgot about it, mm -hmm. and they are very happy to get it off their hands. And a lot of times, the property is in bad shape, and they're embarrassed to uh, to put it on the market. So everybody wins. Sellers save a ton on broker commission, and it's just a very smooth process. Yeah, perfect. So now let's talk about, so to get all these deals done, are you guys raising private equity? Are you, how, do, how are you funding your, your acquisition side? We are a private equity fund. And so we have exclusively external investors. You know, this is not me doing the, the Burr strategy or something like that to put all these together. And that's what turbo charges it, right? That's the 15 to 25 units a month type of capital. But we've got family offices. There's some high net worth folks in there. Uh, one of our largest uh, sources of capital is actually other and larger private equity funds. 
that like exposure to the lower middle market, but they're not set up to do it. The model's so different. And so they uh, chip in either from their fund or indirectly through sidecars. And uh, that's kind of our, our fastest growing capital source. But it's all private equity and then our lender relationships that that get the financing done. Yeah, get as much lender financing as you can, use the private equity to to uh, fill the gap. And now you've got a workable model and you're, you're buying at such a nice cost basis that once you do the work and rehab and put a tenant in there, now your cash flow positive, there's value, uh, intrinsic value there uh, significantly that everybody feels good about it, right? That's it. And uh, we are currently in that kind of nine to 9.5 percent cap rate range once yeah. we're fully stabilized some assets are in the on the low teens some are in the i eights whatever but that's where we average and when you do that versus where portfolios trade over time and in kind of a stabilized interest rate environment we have a model that really scalably repeatably delivers 2.1 to 2.4 x net myc for lps so they like it it's very stable and low real estate risk levels. It's the most boring risk level of of the real estate world. It's multifamily and hyper core areas and gets that kind of close to you know non-real estate private equity return profile. So um, our investors have have really liked it. And once the assets are stabilized, they wick off a ton of cash flow um, each quarter. And so it's been a another example of a kind of a win-win there. Yeah, exactly. When you can get uh, get all your capital happy, they're ready to redeploy and they want to give you more. And which uh, which is the next need is to keep that machine rolling, right? Exactly. So, That's the real front of the funnel, right? Is that the fundraise and then you get to the acquisition stuff. But yeah, nothing That's happens right. until you raise money. Everybody thinks you get to find a deal, you can raise money. Uh, the money will come. Uh, that may be so in single family homes, but it is not <laughs> true in the multifamily side. You need to be finding your money uh, well before in advance and have about and realize that half of it's never going to show up, even though they said, yeah, I'll send it. Oh, yeah. No, when when we first got started, trust me, we had our our fair share of closings in eight days and we're short, you know, this much. So <laughs> we got to figure out what to do. Systematizing and getting loyal long term investors has solved that problem for us. But man, you're so right. If you don't have your money lined up in advance, you are going to be looking, you're going to be very embarrassed. On closing you're becoming a closing and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm naked. And, and uh, like, what, who do I call and how do you put it together? And um, so it really is important. Raising capital is a big piece of this business, right? And, and by the way, I'm just give a shameless plug. If you want to learn how to raise capital, I have a event coming in April. Uh, gosh, I don't know the date. My wife knows it. It's in April. Uh, but go to kahunaboardroom.com uh, right now, kahunaboardroom.com and sign up for it. It's a three-day intensive. And we talk about how to raise capital, um, which, and I do it a little bit uniquely than different than most investors. I'll teach you how to raise fixed. I call it fixed, but I call it six and six, but it's where you get low cost of equity from investors. And um, it, it works really well. It's what I've done uh, pretty much all my life. So there's a shameless plug. We're back to you, Ray. Yeah, not not so uh, not so shameless. I'll tell you that uh, events events like that are how we got launched into you know external fundraising. So they attract folks that are interested in deals, and they it's it's hard work and it's a long day, but man, it, it works. So it really highly recommend. Yeah, thanks. So then, what does the future look like then for you guys? Where do you see yourselves five years from now? We are extremely picky about the markets that we go into, maybe a little too picky, but we like that. We like having that flag in the ground that we can rely on for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But it's all about that. You know, I think this this model, similar to a SFR roll-up model, can work in many different places, some better than others. But for us, it's all about identifying that next MSA and continuing to go out and make the contacts that you need build the beachhead of contractors and local vendors, legal that's teams, the next et That's really when you talk about the systematizing, you're going to pick those markets and then you got to build your teams Oh yeah, to, to do the work. And that's, that's probably the hardest part of your business is developing the teams. Cause it's like, we can, it's easy to buy something. It's a way more difficult to then renovate it and get it done in a timely manner uh, without spending a whole crap ton of money. Oh yeah. I mean, renovations are, uh, 
are very, are very difficult. But a, I mean, a lot of what we do, a lot of the way that we differentiate ourselves, it's like an HR recruitment firm, right? I mean, we talk to contractors for the first time. We get an understanding of what they've done. We vet them. We're constantly networking in groups, meeting folks through jobs, whatever it might be. Start them off with a smaller job, build confidence, build trust. And then before you know it, they're an extension of the team and all of their contractor work that they do is is with us, right? And so building out that network is really a, a time intensive and um, and key part. But we love the Midwest. Uh, we There's some markets in the Northeast that we're interested in, but we've got probably three or four years of roadmap ahead of us before we expand meaningfully outside of that with just MSAs that we're interested in. And... Um, there's a lot of opportunity for this in, in in markets outside the U.S. too. So that's really our, our long-term trajectory is this is a space that we understand and can take advantage of, and we're going to keep doing that. That's awesome. I'm so excited to hear that. Like, I love seeing people winning. Sometimes really understanding your system, getting good at it, not just getting good at it, but getting great at it. Uh, experts make money. Uh, journalists make excuses. And so, uh, you know, Raymond, you, you've become an expert, right? And becoming an expert at that little tranche of where you're, you're focused at, um, it allows you so much more leverage in the marketplace and to others. And uh, so I'm going to challenge everybody listening right now. You've really got to figure out your piece. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of uh, uh, figuring out what it is. But once you find it, don't change. Get really good at it. And when that happens, magic usually happens right on the other end. And that's what that's what Ray is talking about right now is the magic he's his company's receiving because they figured some stuff out. And, and now it's and, working. And be honest about you know what you're bad at too. And if you need to fill that gap with a partner or a resource you need to hire, whatever it is, do that. Because once you've got the whole ship moving, man, it's uh it's fun. Awesome. So uh as we wrap it up, uh any books you've been reading or anything that's that, that, that you feel like is, has been a good that you'd, you'd like to share? Yeah, um, I think uh, the, the one that I'm reading right now is a, is a pretty good one. It's a I'm a big biography reader. So I in the last six months I've done uh, Washington, Grant, the Hamilton biography, love Ron Chernow. I think uh, learning from folks like that is it can be more effective and a more narrative version to understand what makes somebody super successful. Yeah. Um, and uh, the one I'm reading right now is uh, a Caesar biography. It's just called Caesar. And it's about his life from early childhood to making him making his way in the world and what he did to kind of crest that. All right, I'm a successful person in society up into man, I'm a really important person in society and then on to, uh, on to emperor there. So, uh, but that's a, that's a great one would highly recommend. And, uh, I always, uh, I would say 50, 50, I'm, I'm book and on audible. So I sneak in a lot more content that way. Yeah, exactly. Put it on 2.0 baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what advice would you give to, to some of the newer people or the ones that are kind of doing it for just a, a, a minute that what advice would you want to give them? Yeah, I think uh, you know the 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 main piece of advice is just be true to yourself and honest with what you like and what you're good at and what you're not good at. Real estate is an awesome thing because it's so diverse. People think of it as just one industry, but really it's so many different things from storage, farmland, multifam, commercial, single. There's just so many different ways and stories to do it. But figure out what you like and what you're passionate about. And then be honest with yourself about where your gaps are and what you're not good at, and uh, and be proactive about you know filling that in. Um, but the uh, the the other piece I would say is especially if you haven't jumped into the water yet, do it on a small deal. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways, especially for first time investors, to to finance properties with really high loan to value debt and get in there, figure it out. You're going to make mistakes. There's nothing wrong with that, but have fun. It's a, it's a beautiful asset class and, and get your hands dirty and enjoy. Amen. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Love it. Appreciate that. Well, listen, uh, man, I want to thank you for coming on and just kind of sharing some value. Like I'll tell you, 
I know that little that little niche that you're talking about is on fire, but a lot of people don't even know about it. They're they're still focused on the big stuff. And um, so thanks for shedding some light on that, Ray, of what that opportunity looks like and feels like. Guys, success starts and happens with a belief. Raymond went to college, uh, or you went to college in New York, right? Yep. And somehow found his way into real estate, right? And to get real successful, you have to start believing. You can't just say, no one ever did anything part-time forever. And I like how you transitioned said in my part-time gig, became my full-time gig. And when it became your full-time gig, a change had to happen. And I believe that's that change happens in our minds, guys, because nothing great happens without full commitment to it, right? When you fully commit to something, it's amazing how it takes so long just to get there and you're doing it one foot in, but once you fully commit and you step on the gas, you see yourself going over a uh, a curve that is that will really yield success a lot faster than you think, guys. So I'll just tell you this, like I say to every podcast, if you believe it, you can achieve it and your paradise is possible.